Yeah, can we celebrate the word of God with a shout? Glory! Amen! Grab your pen, your notebook, your Bible. You can be seated with your sweet, smart self as we get into the word of God today. The book of 2 Corinthians chapter 5 verse 17. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 verse number 17. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. All things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. Next verse. And all things are of God who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ and had given to us the ministry of reconciliation. Now, to drive home the point, let's look at verse 16 of the same Second Corinthians chapter 5. Second Corinthians chapter 5 verse 16. Wherefore, henceforth know we no man after the flesh. Yea, though we have known Christ after the flesh, yet now henceforth know we him no more. Give me the amplified of verse 16, the amplified version. He says, consequently from now on, we estimate and regard no one from a purely human point of view in terms of natural standards of value. No, even though we once did estimate Christ from a human viewpoint and as a man, yet now we have such knowledge of him that we know him no longer in terms of the flesh. So that is, we do not estimate or see people from the human point of view. We now look at people through the eyes of the word of God. When we look at people, we use the word of God to look at people. That is our binoculars for looking at people is the word of God. Remember we said that not everybody in the world is a child of God. He says, behold, in 1 John chapter 3 verse 2, now are we the sons of God. The Bible tells us also in Ephesians chapter 2 verse 18 and 19 that we belong to the household of God. The minute you are born again, you belong to the family. The word household means family of God. So there is a family of God. Ephesians chapter 3 verse 14 and 15. Ephesians 3 14 and 15. For this cause I bow my knees unto the father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named. So you belong to the household of God the minute you are born again. So there's a family of God. And there's a family in the earth, in heaven and on earth. It is called the household of God. The household of God is the church. The church is the body of Christ. The family of God. And God is our father. So all of us belong that are born again to the same family. It is the family of God. But not everybody on earth is born of God. So Jesus in John 8.44 talks about those whose father is the devil. In John 8.44, you are of your father the devil. So there are people whose father is the devil. First John chapter 3 verse 10. First John chapter 3 verse number 10. In this, the children of God are manifest and the children of the devil. So there are children of God and there are children of the devil. So there are two families on earth. There are two families on earth. And every human being belongs to one of these two families. And that is why we have established that anyone who has refused to receive the gospel of Christ is in the family of Satan. We exhausted that a few days ago in the course of this teaching. And we must not, cannot have close relationship, intimate relationship with an unbeliever a child of god cannot have any form of intimacy with an unbeliever do not be unequally yoked with unbelievers there's no relationship between light and darkness christ and belial have nothing in common the temple of god and the temple of idols cannot fellowship light and darkness does not coexist together so as a child of god when you got saved your friendship changed you are no more a friend of the world. Because friendship with the world is enmity with God. A man that is a friend of the world is an enemy of God. So a child of God is born of God. 
And whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world. You are a brand new being. You are a species that never existed before. You are a race of being that this earth cannot understand. The world knew him not. Therefore, it knows us not. The world doesn't know us. So we can be their friend. They hate Jesus. They cannot love you. You can't be their friend. To befriend an unbeliever is to associate with Satan. Because every unbeliever is a child of Satan. There are only two families. <laughs> the family of God and the family of the devil. You cannot be a child of God by accident. You have to be born. And you're only brought into the kingdom of God by the gospel of Christ. There are no two ways about it. All right? Colossians chapter 3 verse 18. Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as it is fit in the Lord. Submit yourselves to your own. If your Bible is mine, I will underline your own. Why does he use your own? It means there's only one person you should submit to. Your husband. Because your husband is your keeper. Your husband is your head. Give me the amplified of Colossians chapter 3 verse 18. Wives be subject to your husbands. Subordinate and adapt yourselves to them. As is right and fitting. And your proper duty in the law. So when you submit to your husband, who are you submitting to? To Jesus. You are not weak. When a woman submits to her husband, it's not a sign of weakness. It's not. It's submission to Jesus. Submit as in the Lord. So a woman that is submissive to her husband honors Jesus. A woman that submits to her husband honors Jesus. Jesus. You know, we have adopted many ideas from the world and its traditions. You hear things like the woman is the neck, the husband is the head. So, anywhere the woman likes, the husband must turn to. All those are worldly ideas. They are not Bible. You know, one time they say behind every man is a woman. Then the women liberation movement came out with not behind, it's beside. You know, all, all kinds of things. And uh, and, uh, you know, uh, all those thoughts were gotten from the women liberation movement. And I have nothing personal against the women liberation movement. You know, somebody asked a question on human rights. And I said, first of all, human rights is not scriptural. Because human rights actually came out of oppression, slavery. So the world had a convention to give rights to people. Right to life, right to worship, right to religion, right to all the rights. Okay, and the rights are okay. In fact, in the scripture, we have better rights than the human rights in the word of God. Because in the world system, things are not really fair. There's no fairness. Fairness is only in Christ. You remember the woman caught in the very act of adultery? You cannot catch a woman in the act of adultery. You cannot catch a woman. You are to catch man and woman. Because a woman does not commit adultery. But they caught a woman. What happened to the man? If it was in the very act. It means two of them were together. Why did you choose to carry the woman? So, even in the societal standards, even when Jesus was on earth, the society was against women. Women were oppressed. Women were suppressed. And Christ looked at the woman and said, woman. He didn't call her a prostitute. He didn't abuse her. He called her woman. He gave her back her dignity. There are better rights in Christ than the world can offer. Are you all understanding? And, and that is why in Christ Jesus, we use our rights to serve God. And we use our rights to serve one another. We do not use our rights as an occasion to gratify the flesh. That is where the human rights movement has a limitation. Because in the human rights movement of the secular, the end profit is personal. Personal profit. Human worship. You know, it ends up in humanism. It ends up in humanism, not in the worship of God. Because again, if you observe some of these secular movements, they are very good. They have their good points, but sometimes they take things to extreme. Where now you have gay, you have 
you know, anti-God operations, lesbianism and all of that. And some of these women liberation movement ideologies in Europe have destroyed a lot of homes. Even in Africa, they're coming in because they're bringing in ideologies that do not glorify God. And that's why the church must be careful because what the world defines must not be what we define. We must take our definitions from the scripture. If that's clear, can I have a good amen? Because all scripture is given to us and it is profitable for teaching. And from our teaching, we have our persuasion. From our persuasion, we have our correction. From our correction, we have our instruction in righteousness. So, we stay within the confines of God's word. We began to deal with the fact that in Christ Jesus, we stay within the confines of God's word. Look at Ephesians chapter 5 verse 22. Ephesians chapter 5 verse number 22. Wives, submit yourselves unto your own, on the line own, unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. Give me the amplified of Ephesians 5.22. Wives, be subject be submissive and adapt yourselves to your own husbands as a service to the Lord. When a woman submits to her husband, she is serving Christ. A woman submitting to her husband is a service to Jesus. A service to Jesus. Who are the wives? A wife is a woman in marriage. A wife is a woman in marriage. It is repeated again. Submit to your husbands. And then sometimes you hear thoughts like, uh, you know, <laughs> uh, come up with thoughts before you make any decision. Make sure your wife agrees. Your wife must agree. If she doesn't agree, you cannot do it. Those thoughts are not from the word of God. Anything you want to do and your wife does not support you, don't do it. No, it's not about your wife supporting it. It's about does the word of God support it. That should be the point. Not does your wife support it. Does the word of God support it. Does it function within the wisdom of God. That's what matters. Because at the end of the day, if you observe, do you agree with the Lord before the Lord does anything? Huh? You don't have to agree with the Lord before he does anything. He doesn't have to wait for your agreement. He is the Lord. And you are to submit as unto the Lord. As unto the Lord. Do you and the Lord make decisions together? Huh? It's a question now. Do you and the Lord make decisions together? No. He makes decisions and you comply. I need to put things in order. As unto the Lord. Look at verse 23 of Ephesians chapter 5. For the husband is head of the wife. As Christ is the head of the church, himself the savior of his body. Himself the savior of his body. Did he say the husband is a co-head with the wife? Huh? The husband is a co-head. What did he say? The husband is the head. It's not co-headship. The husband is the head. Of the wife. I've had, like I said, people say the wife is the neck. So who is the body? The children, who are the legs? The cats and the dogs. The husband is the head, the wife is the body. The husband is the head, the wife is the body. That's the scriptures. The husband is the head of the wife. The wife is the body. There is no mention of children. There are only two people in a marriage. Husband and wife. Husband, head, wife, body. 
So you see, we have imported thoughts. And this is the reason why many Christian marriages shamefully are going down the drain because they have built it on a wrong foundation. Look at verse 23 again of Ephesians chapter 5. For the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ is the head of the church, himself the savior of his body. So he relates the relationship with Christ and the church. Look at verse 24 of that Ephesians chapter 5. Therefore, as the head is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. On the line, in everything. Give me the amplified, amplified version of verse 24. As the church is subject to Christ, so let wives also be subject in everything to their husbands. In everything. So, let the wives be to their husband, their own, own, own husbands in everything. Why does he give this kind of instructions? Don't forget. Don't forget. Because I have heard women say, my husband is not a believer. He doesn't want me to come to church. Should I submit or should I come to church? My husband is not a believer. He doesn't want me to go for evangelism. Should I submit? Because the Bible says, submit in everything. Now listen carefully. These instructions are for believers. These instructions are for believers. Two believers in marriage. Husband born again, wife born again. I will soon get to instructions between a believing wife and an unbelieving husband or a believing husband and an unbelieving wife. But until I get there, don't forget that what we are reading now is for two believers in Christ. So the wife and the husband in Christ, then the wife submit to the husband in everything. An unbeliever cannot love. An unbeliever cannot love. Husband, love your wives. An unbeliever cannot love because the love has to be modeled as Christ. And an unbeliever is not in Christ. So an unbeliever cannot love. What you call love is not what the Bible calls love. The Bible has its own definition of love. And the Bible is our book of instructions. An unbeliever cannot love. Only a believer can love. And the love is as Christ. Love the church. So he's writing to the church. The marriage that is recognized in heaven as of God is between two Christians. The marriage that heaven recognizes as of God is the marriage between two Christians. So he's talking to believers. That's why he said, you submit to your husband in everything. I'm going to take you, like I said, to where he speaks to women and men who are married to non-Christians. Who got married before they received the gospel. Because he gave them instructions. So he says, who are those involved? Two parties. Husband and wife. Does it include the children? No. Who is the head? Please talk to me, Power City. Who is the head? Who is the body? No other person involved. So the instruction here is for Christian women. This letter is not a newspaper. It was written to people in Christ. People in Christ. So it's not a film or a movie. It's written to people who are born again. Look at Ephesians chapter 1 verse 1. So you see who the letter was written to. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God. To the saints which are at Ephesus and to the faithful in Christ Jesus. So the book of Ephesians is written to the saints. It's written to those in Christ. Look at Colossians chapter 1 verse 2. So you know who these letters are written to. To the saints and faithful brethren in Christ. In Christ. Which are at Colossae. Grace be unto you and peace from God our Father 
and the Lord Jesus Christ. So this is not talking to everybody. This is talking to Christians. So he's saying here, the wife is subject to her husband as the church is subject to Christ. If you go on Ephesians 5, 28 and 29, Ephesians chapter 5, 28 and 29. So ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. He that loveth his wife loveth himself. Next verse. For no man ever yet hated his own flesh, but nourisheth and cherisheth it even as the Lord, the church. So it lets you know that the body is the wife. The head is the husband. Look at verse 33 of that same Ephesians chapter 5. Nevertheless, let every one of you in particular so love his wife even as himself. And the wife see that she reverence her husband. The wife see that she reverence or respects. Give me the amplified of verse 33. Please pay attention. However, let each of you, without exception, love his wife as being in a sense his very own self. And let the wife see that she respects and reverences her husband. That she notices him, regards him, honors him, prefers him, venerates and esteems him. And that she defers to him. Praises him and loves and oh, I love this translation and loves and admires him exceedingly. In fact, throughout this series, we shall be reading Amplified. <laughs> the Bible never asks the woman to love the husband. The woman has no assignment of loving. Don't bother. The man is to love. You are to submit. Don't be loving me when you should be submitting. Now I'm not talking to mama. Mama submits to me. We are very happy. We don't have problem. You can see it. She's a wonderful woman. Yes. If I have problem, you will know it in my messages. When a pastor is not happy to show in his messages. Oh, we are happy. You know. I'm excited. And that's why we want all the marriages in Power City to be happy homes. Both in the headquarters, in the branches, all over the world. We don't want to have marriages that are full of tension, wahala, breakdown. No, 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 no. That's what we're teaching. This teaching is vaccination against uh, marriage virus. <laughs> Amen. Okay, so God never said the woman should love the husband. That's where many, many women have problems. Instead of a woman submitting to her husband, she's busy loving him. Darling, I love you. I love you. I love you. If I didn't love you, eh, I love you. The man is hungry. You are shouting, I love you. I love you. Darling, I love you. I've just sent for ice cream for you. Just be patient. It's coming. Ice cream in the afternoon. African man. Ice cream. No. Don't be loving. Don't be loving him. Just submit. Your submission is the language that you use in loving him. If there's anything like that. But the husband is the man to love. I love my husband. That does not keep the marriage. I love my husband. That does not keep the home. That's why many marriages are broken. And the wife is still crying. I really love my husband. Though. It's just that we couldn't stay together. That's why the home scattered. Because you were loving. A wife is supposed to submit. Loving your husband doesn't keep your home. It is respect and honor and reverence for your husband that keeps your home. Respect, honor, 
reverence. That's what keeps your home. Please listen carefully. Young girls that are planning to marry, hear me well. Loving your husband doesn't keep your home. It is respect, honor, and reverence to your husband that keeps your home. You are supposed to submit to him in love. We will see that later. But the key ingredient is submission. You are a wife or you are going to be one. You need to understand the word of God about marriage. You need to understand. And I'm going to speak to singles in a bit. There's no instruction in the word of God for wives to love their husbands. The instruction is to submit. Be submissive to your husband. There's no point going for a long-term marriage counseling. You are wasting your time and our time. There's, those instructions are plain. Those instructions are simple. They don't take 10 hours. Just read it. Wives, submit yourself to your own husbands in everything. Talking to Christians. now. Simple. Reverence him, honor him, respect him. Case closed. There will be no tension. There will be no tension. There will be no wahala. There will be no problem. Now, but many of us are gone to school. And this is where we need to renew our mind. As a woman, you need to renew your mind, especially. You were in class with the boys. And you were taking number one, they were taking number 20. You are trashing the boys in your class with intelligence. And then after that, when you compete with them, you beat them hands down. You argue with them and you defeat them. And you look at them and tell them, don't be silly. Don't be stupid. And they tell you, I'm sorry. And even when your husband wanted to marry you, he had to beg you. Please, darling, I beg you, if you don't marry me, I will die. So you have that air of superiority. And you grew with that mindset. Where you see every man obeying you and submitting to you. And to make matters worse, you work in an office where men are under you, you are their boss. Come here. Go out. Stop that. I'm sorry, ma. I'm sorry, ma. Then you come home. And your husband says, where is my food? You say, sit down, my friend. You know where I'm coming from? I've been working since morning. Uh, that house is not going to stand, though. Huh. That house will not stand. So you need to renew your mind. Especially if you want to remain married. You need to renew your mind. Because you can't continue with that mindset in a marriage. And today, you, you know the way they apply to women for marriage. You go to supermarket. You carry ring in your pocket. Then in the midst of crowd, you kneel down. Please, can you marry me? That's not marriage. That's showmanship. Man is kneeling down in the market to beg a girl to marry him. That's no more marriage. That's no more marriage. <laughs> if you were planning, in, if I catch you, <laughs> you are a member of the, if I catch you, you will know that I'm your spiritual father. Amen. <laughs> you are in this world. You are not of this world. So now you are married to that man. You need to renew your mind. The Bible never makes marriage a compulsory relationship for anybody. You must not marry. You must not marry. Once you discover that you cannot submit to a man, please don't marry. The Bible gives you the right to live as a single person forever. You don't have to. But once you decide to marry, make up your mind.
to submit. Once you decide, it's not by force. But if you must marry, then as a woman, you must bring down yourself to a place of submission. Because that is your honoring the Lord and that is your service to Jesus. Marriage is a choice. Not getting married does not mean you are not fulfilled. You can be fulfilled without a husband. You can be fulfilled without a wife. You can live a good life. There are a lot of single people that are living better than some married people. Am I talking here? Marriage where a woman is pursuing a man in the bush with matchet. Is that a marriage? Why must you marry? You must know why you must marry. Because when something does not have a purpose, a views is inevitable. You don't, hey, listen everybody. You don't have to marry. There's no scripture that say if you don't marry, you will not make heaven. There's no scripture that say if you don't marry, you are a half human being. You don't have to. Marriage is a choice. And don't let anybody intimidate you and say, if you don't marry, there are favors you cannot get. Because he that finds a wife, finds a good thing and obtain favor. When you marry, there are doors that will open to you. That's not true. That's not true. That's not true. You are not complete until you are married. There's this blessing that comes with marriage. Those are motivational speakers. Don't listen to them. 1 Corinthians 7 34. There is difference also between a wife and a virgin. A virgin is a lady that is not married. The unmarried woman cared for the things of the Lord that she may be holy both in body and in spirit. The unmarried woman, please follow this. The unmarried woman cared for the things of the Lord that she may be holy both in body and in spirit. But she that is married cared for the things of the world, how she may please her husband. How she may please her husband. You know, some ladies are not married, but they are married. Some ladies are not married, but they are married. They are caring for a man that they are hoping to marry them. You understand? They are caring for a man that they are hoping to marry them. So they are already caring for a man. A responsibility for the married. Instead of caring for the Lord. They are caring for a man. They take their salary and give him. They cook and bring for him. He tells them, any woman I will marry, I have to taste her food first. If I don't taste her food, I will not marry her. So three women are bringing food to his house. He is eating free of charge. Three square meals. One in the morning, another woman in the afternoon, another in the evening. Wicked man. Any woman that I don't eat her food, I cannot marry her. They are busy bringing food three times a day. The man is eating free of charge. Say, please, the afternoon food is coming late. Time is important in the decision. The food must arrive before one o'clock. <laughs> There's a lady that took care of one guy that used to be my friend for seven years. Seven, mama knows. Seven years. She was cooking and bringing. Every morning on her way to work, she would drop bag of food. Every evening on her way from work, she would drop dinner. Serving, serving like a slave for seven years. And at the seventh year, the man went to Lagos. For the first time in his life. When he arrived Lagos. He saw this is Lagos. And he forgot the girl. The day he wrote her. And told her. My, my dear. Please let this not be a surprise. I have decided to move on. Send me a calculation. Of your investment on my life. I will refund. She fell down and collapsed. They took her to hospital. 
It took time to resuscitate her. She died. Some of you girls are following a man for three years. He has not explained anything. Three years. No explanation. Some of you girls, your problem is you have no self-esteem. Number two, you're suffering from identity crisis. Number three, you, you, don't, you don't believe in yourself. You don't believe in what Christ has done. You believe that only a man can complete. I will soon reach singles. Let me continue with wives. Let me continue with wives. You're cooking for a man who is not your husband. When you should be caring for the things of the Lord. Meanwhile, you don't come for prayer meeting. You don't come for prayer cruise. Evangelism, you're not there. Discipleship, you're not there. But you're serving a man that has not approached you. Thinking that with food, you will compel him to marry you. Because they told you in your village that the way to a man's heart is his mouth. Or his stomach. <laughs> okay. Village proverbs. Rather than enjoy your singleness. Enjoy being single. Make the most of it. Serve God. Live out a fulfilled life. Pursue career. Achieve the things you should achieve as a single person. You are busy chasing a boy around. The married cares for the things of the world, how she may please her husband. So, the woman who is the wife will seek to please her husband. Please underline the word please. If you are making notes as a woman, write that please in capital letters. P-L-E-A-S-E. -E. Please her husband. Remember, we are talking about believers. Respect. Respect goes into how you treat your husband. Respect goes into how you call your husband. Respect goes into how you speak to your husband, both in his presence and in his absence. How you call him, how you treat him, how you speak to him in his presence and in his absence. All that is a definition of respect, which is honor. You know, today we have, like I said, lovely names. Sugar, sweetheart, baby. You're calling a full-grown man, baby. He will soon collect in bottle from you. Very lovely pet names. But we have to be careful because we don't want to get into the worldly way of doing things. Before sweetheart, before sugar, before pepper, before salt his head the bible definition for a husband is head head my head that is the way god sees a husband and a wife the husband is head what god cares is his own instructions you can't modify god's instruction you only align what is god's instruction for a wife as it relates to her acknowledging her husband as head. My head. Not sweetie. My head. It is after you call head, you can add sweetie. Head sweetie. Head baby. <laughs> head pepper. <laughs> Head mosquito. <laughs> but it first of all has to be head. That's what honors God. When a woman calls her husband my head, it gives God honor. Because that's what the word of God teaches. Don't say I like that couple. You know they are friends. The wife can just tell the husband, are you mad? Are you silly? Idiot. And the husband will say, thank you man. That's a bad model. They are not honoring God. They are not honoring God. You have to act on the word. Your commitment should be to the word as a woman. Your commitment should be to the word, not to your husband, to the word. When you are committed to the word, you, that commitment will affect your husband. Your commitment should be to the word, not to your husband. And when you are committed to the word, the word will streamline how you treat your husband. The word will streamline how you respond. The word will streamline how you treat him. So your commitment is primarily to the word as a woman.
Look at First Peter chapter 3. Peter now begins to speak to those who coincidentally got married to unbelievers as unbelievers. First Peter 3 1. Likewise, see wives, be in subjection to your own husbands, that if any obey not the word, they also may without the word be won by the conversation of the wives. Give me the amplified. In like manner, you married women, be submissive to your own husband, subordinate yourselves as being secondary to and dependent on them and adapt yourselves to them so that even if any do not obey the word of God, they may be won over, not by discussion, but by the godly lives of their wives. Not by discussion, but by the godly lives of their wives. Not by discussion. Why did he use likewise? Because he had previously said in First Peter chapter 2 verse 25, that was the thing he said before he said likewise. First Peter 2 25, for you were going astray like so many sheep, but now you have come back to the shepherd and guardian, the bishop of your souls. Then the next verse. Likewise. Likewise ye wives that are now born again. The overseer of your souls. Have you observed that every time he mentions wives, he said to your own husbands. Your own. That's why a man you cannot respect, don't marry him. The moment somebody says, I want to marry you as a woman, the first thing you ask yourself is, can I respect this man? Can I submit to this man? Can I call this guy my lord? If inside you feel no, tell him to go. Tell him, because that marriage will not work. That's the first thing you ask yourself. Can, is this the kind of person I want to be my head? Those are the questions you ask yourself. The scripture says a lot about the behavior of the wife at home. It's a major issue in, in the New Testament. The behavior of a wife at home. Look at that first Peter chapter 3 verse 2. Look at the amplified of verse 2 of that same Peter. When they observe the pure and modest way in which you conduct yourselves. Together with your reverence for your husband. You are to feel for him. All that reverence includes... To respect, defer to, revere him, to honor, esteem, appreciate, prize, and in the human sense, to adore him. That is, to admire, praise, be devoted. I just love this amplifier. Be devoted to, deeply love, and enjoy your husband. Let me go over it again. Women, are you here? Okay, let me read so you hear. Uh, don't say I love you, my husband. You are to feel for him. And all that reverence includes, you can make a list if you like. Respect, defer to, revere him, honor, esteem, appreciate, prize, and in the human sense, Adore him. Admire. Praise. Be devoted to. Deeply love. And enjoy your husband. If a woman does this. Even if her husband is demonized. That marriage will continue. That home will be good. Because that's what Peter was saying. Now. Even if the husband is not a believer. Even if the husband is an evil person. Even if the husband is an occultist. These are the things a woman will do and win him. He said, don't discuss. Don't be quoting Bible for him. Let your behavior be the quotation. Let him be reading, for God so loved the world in your behavior. Everything is quiet. Did you see secondary? Did you see that the wife is secondary? 
Eh? He didn't say women are secondary. He said the wife is secondary. Not women. The wife is a secondary tool. Look at verse 3. Amplified. Let not yours be the merely external adorning with elaborate interweaving and knotting Brazilian hair, German hair, Jamaican hair. Eh? Is this Nigerian one now? The wearing of jewelry or changes of clothes. Don't use all those things because they will not work. They won't work. Fashion. They won't work. Don't use them. Because you can't do those things in that list and keep malice with your husband. You can't admire him, honor him, adore him, reverence him, feel for him and keep malice. A woman keeping malice with her husband is not doing these things because you can't, those, you can't do the two. Are we in the building? You can't. You can't do the two and keep malice. Looking beautiful is not how you keep your home. Attaching bum bum to your bum bum is not enough to keep your home. Because if you are not careful, the thing will misplace. You know what I'm talking about now. Attaching boobs to your boobs is not enough because it can shift. And when you shift, you'll, see, you'll be doing like this as you are walking. And it will look like ant is biting you. <laughs> All that is not going to work. Because it, when you get home, the thing will, you will remove it. Marriage only exists on the truth. So attaching this, attaching this, attaching that is not going to keep a home. What will keep a home without attachment is respect. Honor. Esteem your husband. Revere him. Respect him. Honor him. Celebrate him. Feel for him. Those adjectives are the adjectives that will keep any home. Any. In any society. Under any culture. Those are the adjectives that will keep any home. Hallelujah. I said hallelujah. Sexual relationship is a secondary action. Sex is not enough to keep a marriage. It's a secondary action. The Bible never teaches you to keep your home with sexual relationship. It's one of the responsibilities in marriage, quite all right, but it's not enough to keep a marriage. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 4 and 5. The wife had not power of her own body, but the husband. And likewise also the husband had not power of his own body, but the wife. Verse 5. Defraud ye not one the other, except it be with consent. For a time that ye may give yourselves to fasting and prayer and come together again, that Satan tempt you not for your incontinency. Alright? So, the way you act in marriage as a woman is your submission. Your conduct. The way you act towards your husband. How you treat your husband. He says, it's not about clothes. You see the movies. Movie stars, they spend a fortune to buy clothes. To buy gold, to buy jewelry. And they get married after seven days, they scatter. It doesn't last. Because the marriage itself was a movie. Some of them, you see them dress. Fashion stars. They move like they never go to toilet. Everything is sparkling. But yet they cannot keep a home. They cannot keep a home. Why can they not keep a home? Because everything for them is movie and acting. It's never reality. And if you ask the lady, how are you? What's your name? She says, well, I am Mrs. John, formerly Mrs. James, formerly Mrs. Darrell, formerly Mrs. Ebenezer. <laughs> That's, she, this is the fourth marriage. So it's not beauty. Young woman, make the change. Grow up. Make up your mind that I'm going to marry and anybody I'm married to, I will submit to. 
You've got to make that decision right now. Because that is what will glorify God. That is what will glorify God. The way you just open your mouth and talk carelessly. <clears throat> you have to learn to act on the word. There's no anointing on the wedding day that will change a woman. So when you start relating and the woman is behaving funny, stop it. There is no anointing that will come on the wedding and change her. When you start interfacing for marriage and you observe certain behaviors, challenge them. Don't pretend. Don't say, I know by faith she will change. Your faith cannot change somebody. And I'm sure I've taught you in this church, there is no one will of God for, uh, for marriage, right? I've taught that before. I'll, I'll deal with it when I get into singles. Look at verse 4 of that Peter. I love that Peter. Give me the amplified of that Peter. But let it be the inward adorning and beauty of the hidden person of the heart with the incorruptible and unfading charm of a gentle and peaceful spirit. When a woman is gentle, she will enjoy her marriage. Gentle woman. Not... <laughs> fight neighbors. Fight outsiders. Fight by water tap. Collect their bucket. Break it. Scatter everywhere. No gentleness. No humility. Fight in the market. Fight on the road. Anytime your husband hears noise, his heart is beating because he is thinking you are the one there. The moment they say, two fighting, two fighting. Oh, father. Oh, heart attack is coming. <laughs> Glory to God. Gentle women always enjoy their marriage. Women, commit yourselves to the word. Commit to the word. If the word of God can change you, it can change somebody else. Act on the word. Let's see the word of God and its life manifested through you. So anyone that is married to a non-Christian, this is your cure now. St. Peter, verse 5, amplified. For it was thus that the pious women of old who hoped in God were accustomed to beautify themselves and were submissive to their husbands, adapting themselves to them as themselves secondary and dependent upon them. The women of old. The women of old. Those are our models. The women of old. Not Nollywood women. Not Hollywood women. Not Bollywood women. But the women of old. Those are the models for Christian women. Because marriage is old. Look at verse 6. Amplified. Verse 6. Amplified. It was thus that Sarah obeyed Abraham following his guidance and acknowledging his headship over her by calling him Lord, Master, Leader, Authority. And you are now her true daughters. If you do right and let nothing terrify you, not giving way to hysterical fears or letting anxieties unnerve you. You become the daughters of Sarah when you model after her. So our models are women of old and our mothers in the church who are exemplary. Not some fashion star. No. Women of old who called their husbands, my lord, master, leader, my authority. 
Some women won't like what I'm teaching. Some women, as I'm teaching, their tummy is turning. It's just that they can't be going to the toilet every five minutes. So they are gathering the toilet so that when I finish, they will release it. Boom! <laughs> Tin is turning them. Because many women, when they hear the word submit, it is like you are telling them bleed. But if you don't want to submit, leave alone. I beg you. Leave alone. It's not a sin. Leave alone. And be happy. Because when you live alone, you have nobody to answer to. Holy God. Answer to God and answer to your pastor in church. Finish. The two responsibility. Go out when you like. Come back when you like. Spend your money the way you like. Eat the way you like. If you like, leave your house dirty. If you like, clean it. Nobody will ask you. If you like, cook. When you don't like, don't cook. But once you're married, you come into a place of submission. So these are the two different lives. The choice is yours. But if you're already married, you have no choice. Sorry. That's the Bible instruction to the married. You must be submissive. Your model should be old women in the Bible whom we read about and the mothers in the church whose lives are exemplary. Submission starts from the premarital relationships that you keep. Acting on the word starts from there. Like I said, you don't start calling a man that has not married you, my Lord. But of course, as you begin to relate, you can tell if this man is the kind of person I want to submit to. And you too can tell if this kind of woman can submit. You can tell as you begin to relate. Without cooking for him. And bringing food morning after the evening. Every one of God's children can submit. Because the fruit of the spirit is gentleness. Meekness. And you learn from a single lady to be submissive. As a single lady you start submitting from your father's house. You submit to your mother. You submit to your father. When your mother gives you instruction you will be her. That's where you learn submission from. You learn submission from your parents. When they speak to you, you take their words. When they rebuke you, you take it in good faith. Not that you are a single girl, your parents are rebuking you, you are pouting all over the house. Mm, because I'm still in this house. Very soon I'll be gone, sir. You will come and talk to me like that. What are you doing? Nothing. You know, you are pouting all over the house. Just because you were rebuked or scolded. That is a sign of how you will do with your husband. Your husband will tell you, I don't like the way you behave. You see how you eat food today. I'm not going to cook food. I will warm for you yesterday morning's food. You will eat yesterday morning's food. No new food. <laughs> I will warm it for you. That rice I cooked last Friday, I will warm it now. For talking to you. <laughs> Should I close? <laughs> Praise God. Are women secondary? No. Women are not secondary, but wives are. Women are not secondary, but wives are. Because a wife only submits to one person. And she's secondary to that person. But women are not secondary. In their place of work, women are better than some men. Women are better than some men. They can do better than some men. So they are not secondary. But in, in the home, a wife is secondary. The husband is the head. Who is a wife? A woman in a marriage. You are not a wife in your office. You are not a wife on your job. You are not a wife in your business. You are only a wife in your home. So don't go to your office and be treating your boss like your husband. And say, Bible says you submit. Eh, eh, that's misplaced. In your office, you are as equal to everybody. You do your job well. Don't take shit from anybody. Do what you need to do. 
If anybody is not supposed to instruct you, instruct you, tell him stop that. You don't have the right to do that. And walk away. Because you are not subservient to anybody. You have equal rights with everybody in that office. But once you come home, you remove office cloth. You put inside box. You wear wife's cloth. My master, what can I make for you? Oh, what do you want? The husband said, I don't want the food hot. Yes, sir. I bring it warm. No, don't make it warm. Make it semi-warm. Yes, sir. You go and say, Father, in the name of Jesus, I receive anointing for semi-warm. <laughs> a man that will ask his wife to bring food semi-warm must be a very difficult man. More difficult than me. <laughs> I know I can be difficult, but I've never asked for semi-warm. <laughs> not warm, semi-warm and not cold. Sigh! How do we measure? <laughs> Praise God. I said, praise God. Can you imagine someone telling my wife, don't wear trousers? I will remove your eye. When I remove your eye, I will pray for a miracle of replacement. What? How did you see my wife? How? I asked her to wear trousers. Because I want to see her in trousers. Why? Because the married woman must please her husband. Her dressing is not your responsibility. It's my responsibility. And her dressing is not directed to you. It's directed to me. If you saw it, your eyes went to the wrong place. Put your eyes straight, my friend. Her dressing is for me, not for you. Is this a subtle matter? If I want my wife on mini skirt in my house, I will ask her, wear it. If you see, now you're wahala. She's not for you to see. Whatever I want, I have my wife to wear it because she's there for my pleasure. So every woman dresses to please her husband. That's the Bible. That's the way the Bible teaches it. Even if she doesn't like the dress, if her husband likes it, she has to wear it. Because she's there to please the man. Our homes will be the best on it. So take what I'm teaching you because the Bible is a book of all wisdom. Praise God. The new creation in marriage is submissive. The women, women in this building, say these words with me very loud. I have the spirit of God. Ah, the women are not answering me. <laughs> they are giving me meditation voice. <laughs> Let me hear you very loud. Online women, power city branches and campuses all over the world. Let all the women say with me very loud. I have the spirit of God. I am what the word says I am. I am submissive. Submission is a fruit of my spirit. I don't act worldly. I act on the world. I am born of the world. I do the world. That's the word of God. Wives, be submissive. Be respectful. He says, fear your husband. Fear your husband. Some women talk when the husband is there. How can you be talking? Me, I'm there and you're talking. Oh, I asked two of you questions, you and your husband, and you start answering. You are not honoring Christ. You are a disgrace to Christ. A woman is not supposed to utter a word when her husband is there. Even if the husband is a fool, for marrying him, she is the wife of a fool. She must operate like a fool. What? Since you submitted and agreed to call a fool, my Lord. That's the end of the matter. Even if he embarrasses you, you must grow to where the embarrassment becomes pleasure. So when he's fooling around, you are smiling. <laughs> the best man on it. This man is correct. You see that he is doing. That's why I married him. You have to. You have to. 
There are no other ways. That's the way you honor Jesus. For accepting the foolish things he does. Because you saw it before you married him. And you were happy to be with him. So nothing should change. Praise God. I'm painting pictures because I want single ladies to see well. If you're a Christian woman, when you're talking somewhere and your husband comes in, keep quiet. If you're talking and your husband enters, stop the discourse. Stop. If they ask the question again, do like you don't know what they're talking about. Let your husband talk. And if your husband says what is different from yours, say, I'm sorry, what I said before, this is the best, this is what I actually wanted to say. My husband has just put it right. This is just, you know, my husband, he has a way of explaining it better. This is exactly what I meant. Then re-echo what he said and re-emphasize it. And stand by it. Even if that thing will punish two of you, so let it be. Go home and be punished. <laughs> when you are being punished, be telling him, you see what you have caused for us? <laughs> well, I'm just honoring Christ by following you to suffer. Next time, please think before you answer this kind of this. <laughs> As we are suffering like this, I don't like it, Jesus. It was you I was honoring. Deliver us from this suffering. Uh, Jesus will deliver you. You can never be wrong obeying your husband. Even when he makes mistakes, the grace of God will help you. I'm not joking. I'm not joking. I've made some mistakes as a husband. I think it's last week, honey. I don't know. It's last week or so. We were talking and I said to my wife, because she reminded me of some, some decision I made that didn't turn out really well. And then I now said to her, but honey, you know, even though I've made wrong decisions in, in certain things in our lives, but at the end of the day, I have never led us into the bush. She said, true. She said, very true. Very, very true. I have no regrets whatsoever marrying you. He said, because you've never, even when you make mistakes, somehow, somehow, God has a way of turning the whole thing around to be good. I said, because I am the head of this house. And your submitting to me makes the, the flow of grace in this family to take care of mistakes that I have made. But if the wife decides for the man, there is no grace for the wife deciding for the family. The grace of that home is on the man deciding. I don't know if you understand. Are you all hearing me? <laughs> you are looking at me like this. Yes. The wife has to follow the husband's decision. He's ahead. He's ahead. It's so important. Very important. Treat your husband first. Make him know that he's number one. When people come to visit your office and your husband enters, stand up. My husband has arrived. Let everybody know your husband has come. Not the way your husband come and he's standing outside and he's calling your food. Uh, darling, darling, I'm here. Say, wait, now don't you know I'm in the office? Wait. The man is under the sun. Darling, I've waited for five minutes now. Say, ah, I am walking. You came to my office. Just be waiting there. I will soon come. Even if you are busy, take permission. Go out and say, honey, what is it? Or darling, what is it? Oh, okay. I've heard. Thank you. Thank you. You can go. I will take care of it. You go back. Oh, sorry. It was my husband. I needed to attend to something. Don't be ashamed to announce it was my husband. In the world, they respect women who respect their husbands. The entire world respects women who respect their husbands. If you go to your family with your husband and they bring food, serve your husband first. Don't serve your father. Serve your husband first. Your father is there, but you have left him. Serve your husband first. After you serve your husband, you can serve your uncles and everybody else. You know, we used to go to the village with mama. And when we go to the house, she will be serving me first. I will be feeling uncomfortable. I will look around. Then I will tell her, give other people fear. say, eat your own now. Eat your own. Don't worry. Others will be taken care of. I will still be looking. <laughs> <laughs> the 
The moment they bring food, she will just bring my own. I, I'll tell her, why are you making them look like I'm always hungry? She said, no. <laughs> Mama will say, no. It is the right thing to do. I'm your wife. Eat. Let me take care of you first. I will take care of others. I said, boy, he's making it look like I am the first person that is hungry here. <laughs> But I'm not the first person that is hungry. It's just that. <laughs> praise God. I say praise God. I say praise God. That is the word of God to a married woman. Can everybody say with me, I am what the word says I am. I'm a new creation. Now all the women say I have the spirit of submission. It's not difficult for me to submit to authority. I am submissive to authority. Can I have a good amen? That's a Christian woman. A Christian woman is not a showbiz woman. A Christian woman is not a fashion star. A Christian woman is not Nollywood, Hollywood. She is Christian wood. She's Christ wood. She's Christ wood. She doesn't take all her influences from star, fashion stars, Hollywood. No, no. She takes her influences from Christ. From his word. And from the standard of God's word. She acts on the word. She keeps the right friends. She keeps the right friends. She does not say, how can I be the one cooking morning, afternoon, evening for my husband? Can't he cook? No. Let your husband be the one who willingly says, darling, go and sit down. Let me cook for you. Not you the one. Tell him, cook. Cook. Can't you cook? Don't you know there are men that cook? Cook. Cook. The Bible doesn't say the husband is the cook. The Bible says the husband is the head. And a Christian woman will do what is right. Cook for your husband. Give him food at the right time. Don't punish him with food. Because there are women that punish their husbands with food. I have not eaten. <laughs> you have not eaten. <laughs> when did you give me money last? <laughs> you have not eaten. <laughs> you have not eaten. <laughs> uh, you remember the shoe I told you I want to buy? That shoe. We have to buy it. See, I say I have not eaten. When did you give me money last? I asked you for pocket money three weeks ago. You gave me 5,000. It finished last week. The one you ate yesterday was from my, my money I kept. So if you want us to eat, bring money. I will go to market now. Uh -uh. So you go to market before it? Yes, now because there's nothing. The man will now struggle to find money. Then you will go to market and punish him. Meanwhile, there is food inside your box. You just want to punish him. It's not a Christian behavior. It's not. It's not. There are women who behave like that. I know what I'm talking about. You know how many people I have counseled in my life? I know what I'm talking about. See, ah, Papa, there was food. I was just hiding it. Because that man, that man, when he gives money, we don't know the next time he will give. So we hide it, let him bring another money in case he changes his mind later. A Christian woman doesn't behave like that. Amen. I didn't hear a good amen. So with me, I'm submissive to my husband. Praise God. I say praise God. Stand on your feet. That's all I got for you. Great service. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Next Sunday, we shall face husbands. Don't worry, we started with wives first. So that when we come to husbands, we can continue. Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Lift your right hands to heaven. Father, thank you for the privilege of learning. We do the word, we act the word, we live the word. The word lives through us. So I pray for every woman in this service, every married woman, every single lady, and all the ladies that are planning to get married. I pray for everyone under the sound of my voice. I ask that grace abound towards all our wives. 
Grace abound to us all our single ladies and grace abound to us all our young ladies in the name of Jesus. We decree that any woman here that is in a marriage where she is not happy, that some of the things we have taught today, her eyes be open to see exactly what to do to turn her marriage around in the name of Jesus. And we pray for single ladies that are, are ready to get married, but they are yet to find somebody to marry them. We pray that this will be a season of miracle connections where marriage is concerned. In the name of Jesus, supernatural relationships, supernatural favors, and supernatural connections between single guys and single ladies at this time within this ministry in the name of Jesus and we silence the voice of the enemy we rebuke everything that is contrary we pray for any marriage that is going through turbulence that this will be healing for that marriage in the name of Jesus and we rejoice Lord that your word rules in our hearts rules in our minds and your word makes us the best that it has ever seen and we give you praise in this place that grace is multiplied through the knowledge of your word in Jesus precious name and every believer says that amen on a note of final letter I didn't hear that amen like thunder. If you're blessed, shout, I do the word. I'm born of the word. I live out the word. I didn't hear a good amen. Grab a good offering. Let's give in honor of God's word. In honor of God's word. When you hear this word, you honor the word which you are giving. Your giving enables us to do more, enables us to get the word out to more people, enable more people to come to the knowledge of the truth of God's word. So, I like everybody to grab an offering online. The banking details are there on television. The banking details are there. Radio audience, Mr. Michael Bush will read the banking details to you in the next two or three minutes before we begin ask the counselor. But it's an honor to serve you the grace of God. All our campuses around the world, it's time to give your honor offering. Grab your honor offering all over the world. Let's pray. Lift it up to heaven, Father. We give in faith. We give with joy our offerings. We thank you for the privilege of honoring your word and honoring what Christ has done. On. I ask that as we give, the blessing is upon everyone. Needs are met supernaturally. Desires are granted. And we thank you for the privilege of giving today. In Jesus' precious name. And every believer says a powerful amen. 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 Now listen to me, online community. Like I said, Sunday first and second service will be addressing husbands. So make sure all our husbands are in church. Sunday first and second service so everybody is enriched and everybody is giving instructions in righteousness so that all of us can be thoroughly furnished unto every good work. We love you. Thank you always for giving me the opportunity to serve you the grace of God and don't forget tomorrow evening we keep teaching at 6 p.m. and until we see you again enjoy the grace of God and be blessed. Let's celebrate viewers around the world for being a part of this service. Glory! Amen! Woo! Glory! We trust that you have been blessed by this message. For these, all the messages and books by Dr. Abel Damina, please call plus 234-806-800-9939 or email powercityoffice at gmail.com The three bank accounts as usual, especially for a radio audience, the account name for all three is Power City International. The first bank on this edition of the program is the net 10 12 36 59 12 10 12 36 59 12 UBA number 2 139 26 465 139 26 465 same account name Power City International also for FCMB 29 82 68 2028 20, 29 82 68 2028 20, Is there a question at the back there? Okay, very good. And there's another one there. Good. All right, so let's go. We'd like to answer. So you say the duty of the wife is to submit. In one of the um, verses, I saw love somewhere. Submitting in love. In the amplifier. He didn't say love. Submitting in. I will get there. Bless you. I will get to what it means to submit in love but i'm dealing with submit first okay yeah next question praise the lord forever see you more by name bless you papa we like you said that the the children really do not have a role to play yes in the marital union of the parents yes so i would like to know is there anything will you see it inappropriate for maybe us 
the children to take materials like this and share to the, our parents. That's not playing a role as in playing a role in their marriage. Okay. That's just playing a role in spiritual help. It does not affect what goes on between two of them as per you affecting it. You're just giving them material that will help the two of them. That's not part of it. What we mean is you can't come between two of them. Do you understand? Either to take sides or to say, can I advise? Or to say, mommy, the way daddy talks is not good for you. Or to say, mommy, the way daddy behaves or the way mommy behaves. You don't have a say. You can't because you're interfering. But yes, you can give them materials. You can buy clothes for your father. You can buy clothes for your mother as their child in honor to what they have also done for you. That is not interfering. Is that okay? Next question. Thank you so much for your teaching today. Um, I'm this person that used to hold on to that. When I read the Bible and see that women should submit, I will not feel comfortable. Yeah, no, you how? Like it. I don't. And being that I was, I held this, uh, the Kim Kardashian, all those people, I was looking up to them as a model. Mm. So already I had formed my mind, I had my own principles. But today you have helped me, you have said a lot. I want to say thank you. Please. Thank you so much. But I'll really listen to more of this when it comes to that submission that men and I, I used to say men should cook. I mean, as a husband, you should cook. I understand. <laughs> Thank you so much, Bless Baba. You. Bless you. Bless you. Bless you. I have a question in okay. terms of submission. Okay. I have an aunt. She's very submissive. Everybody knows that. She does everything her husband asks her to do. She can even lick her husband's feet if he asks her to do that, but he beats her. He treats her as though she's, she's nothing. I don't know what she's actually listening to this message right now because I told her to tune into the way that she should listen to you that you can actually provide a solution to what's happening to her. I don't know what to do for her. I want you to help her out because she's listening. She doesn't know what to do okay, right the now. The truth of the matter is, is her husband in the Lord? He claims he is. He claims. He's an elder in church. No, that's not the answer. <laughs> there are elders in church who are occultic people. So that's not enough. But you know what? Tell her again to listen to Sunday when I talk about husbands. And then when I'm through with husbands, I will eventually get to abuse. And I will get to all of that. But we're just building. you know. So tell her to keep listening. We'll take care of it when we get there. Okay? Bless you. Um, thank you very much, Papa. Bless you. So, so I listened ardently to everything you said today. And the brief question I want to ask is because um, two days ago, I was having a conversation with a group of my friends. And a brief argument came up. Some people were of the opinion that religion is a tool of oppression and suppression in today's generation. So the argument was back and forth. And the simple question I want to ask is, in this submission between a wife to a husband, is there a level, an extent in which this submission should say, no, I can't take this anymore again. Because if you are being realistic, some men are animals. I'm so sorry to use that word. Some men are intolerable. Some men are very, very, I don't even know the adjectives using qualifying the behavior. So should there be a threshold or a limit to, oh, I can't take this anymore again? Or should the submission just continue? Because after listening to everything you say, the people arguing for the point that, you know, relig religion is a tool of oppression and submission. A carnal-minded person listening to it would see it as a point to say, this is just a tool of oppression and submission. So should there be a limit to the submission? So first Thank of you. all, let me begin from the argument. True, religion is a tool of oppression. But Christianity is not a religion. So you should have taken care of them by agreeing with them that religion, because yeah, that's why Jesus fought against religion. Jesus was against religion all his life. He went against them. He rebuked them. He opposed them. They killed him. It's religious people who killed Jesus. Jesus didn't come to introduce a religion. Jesus did not bring a religion. Because religion is man's efforts to get to God. In Christianity, we are not making an effort to get to God. In Christianity, God has come to us. So Christianity is not a religion Christianity is a revelation of a relationship with God. Is it clear? Yes. That's the difference. So 
That argument, if you had had this understanding, you will have debunked that argument sharp, sharp. And you will have even had an opportunity to show Jesus to them. So for next time, that's what you should do. Make them know that true religion is a tool of oppression. For example, you know, honey, you know, it's religion, the law of Moses. The law of Moses is religion. And the law of Moses is against women. It's against women. It is in the law of Moses that they took a woman that was caught in adultery and left the man and brought the woman to Jesus and said the law of Moses says stone her. But where is the man? Because you can't catch a woman in the act of adultery alone. They are supposed to be two. What happened to the one? The law of Moses favors the man more than the woman. In fact, in the law of Moses, women have no rights in the law of Moses. Because that's a religion. And the law is a reflection of the hardness of people's hearts. Which is what religion is. Are you understanding? That's why in Islam, you find that in Islam, which is a religion, women don't have much rights. It's men that own women like properties. See, all religions are like that. So religion truly oppresses. But Christianity is not. Christianity is a revelation of a relationship God has extended to man so that God and man can become one. It's actually God upgrading man to his level. And that's where there's liberty in Christ Jesus. You shall know the truth and the truth shall set you free. That's Christianity. Is that clear? So it's Christianity doesn't have oppression. We have liberty in Christ. However, in the submission, is there a limit to submission for a wife? No. In all things. But remember, two believers. Two believers. Which means the husband is loving the wife as Christ. And the wife is submitting to the husband as the church. But if it is not like that, the teaching will come in the process. Because what you are asking now is abuse. Abuse. Where submission extends into abuse. What do we do? We will deal with that. Is that clear? It's, it's still coming. Okay. Papa, I want to ask my question. I have two questions, actually. Okay. I want to ask, based on the teaching you, you taught us last week about a, a man yes. marrying an unbelieving wife before coming to the church. Yes. Uh, Papa, I want to ask, if the man comes to the church and become to be serious in the church, maybe go to Bible school, get serious in the things of the church. Can that man take a, leader, a leadership position in the church, maybe a house pastor, district pastor, or even a branch pastor? Can he take any leadership position in the church? Okay, so he married as an unbeliever. Yes, but sir. But now he's born again. Yes, sir. But his wife is not born again. Yes, sir. And she's still living with him. Yes, sir. And he's on fire. Yes, sir. Can he be a minister in the church? Yes, sir. He can even be a pope. <laughs> Do you understand? He can even be a pope if he wants. Your unbelieving wife does not disqualify you from serving Christ. Do you understand? It doesn't. All right? But through serving Christ, make sure you reveal Christ to her. Because if you really reveal Christ to her by your lifestyle, she will follow you to Christ. Same thing with the wife. It doesn't at all. I thank God for this the privilege you've given me. But I have two questions to ask, if you permit me. Okay. Uh, but before well, I do that, I have some remarks to make. Okay. I have uh, been listening to you, and the next month will be one year I've been here. You are sitting, and your, your answers to the station with Peter Gordita Magabush just abolish me the depth of knowledge that you have. So I was thinking, but look at this man, now we have, you have an encyclopedia, a living person encyclopedia. <laughs> 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 encyclopedia gives information about all areas of knowledge. But don't go to the young information. It, gives, it educates. It gives our feeling and charges on for action. That is what I say to you. That is what I have experienced. So uh, you are indeed a lady in South Korea in the script. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Uh, I'm very happy that uh, we are following this uh, generation.
generation, God has given it to you, given it all to you. Please share in this generation. To inform us, to educate us. And we are very happy to have you. And especially, we bring you down to Nigeria, not only Nigeria, but quite a state. So we are so close to you. And uh, I'm, I'm so happy. God bless you. Thank and you. I hope God will also take you to deeper and wider north of the mind of Christ. Amen. So you are, you are the mind of Christ. Amen. Praise God. Praise God. And God will take you deeper and wider into the limitless expanse of God's knowledge. Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So, um, in your teaching, in all your teaching, you have been teaching a copious number of scriptural references. And then and again, you add many scriptures good for your health. I've been uh, asking myself, what does the pastor mean? That if somebody is sick and uh, uh, is able to sit up and read all those scriptures, they will get well. Or if somebody is already enjoying health, then they will be more, more, have more abundant. So I can't come to tell you those things. That's why I'm asking you, sir. What okay. do you actually mean? When I say it's good for your health. Yeah. Okay. Many scriptures are good for your health. Okay. How? Okay. <laughs> I will answer. Is there another question? Yes. Okay. S second question. Okay. B, which says, if you deny him, he will all be denied. Okay. And you have been teaching us about the character of God. Yes. And God doesn't depict the character of God. Yes. It takes me back to the Moses' law. Yes. And I will ask a good point of view. Yes. If I, being evil, deny him out of many ignorance, yes. then what should God that is righteous deny me? What okay. Where is the character? Yes. Okay, that's a good question. Thank you. Now, the first question. Um, good for your health. It's good for your spiritual health. What it means is, I'm giving you many scriptures that will enrich your spiritual understanding. That's what it means by, it's good for your health. Health there is spiritual well-being. So that tomorrow you too can be able to teach somebody as good as that. That's what that simply means. Then the second question, if you deny me, I will deny you. It's a context in that scripture where you quoted, where Brother Paul was communicating on works, works of service, not salvation. The denial there is a figure of speech. And what he was communicating there is that if you refuse to comply with the demands that make your service to be accepted, your service will not be accepted. That's all. It's not denial as in rejecting you. It's a figure of communication within a context where Brother Paul is saying, look, if you don't do what you need to do the way you should do it, when it is presented before the Lord, it will not pass the test. That's all it means. Nothing more than that. Is it clear? Bless you. Papa, my question goes thus. There is a portion in the book of Proverbs that says that it is preferable for a man to live on top of a roof than to live in the same house with a nagging woman. Yes. Please, I need an explanation on that. That is the explanation. <laughs> <laughs> that is the explanation you just gave. That it is better to live on top of the house. Let rain beat you. Let mosquito bite you there than to stay with a woman that is contentious, that nags, that is troublesome. What it is the book of wisdom. They are parables. The book of Proverbs, they are called PP sayings. They are parables. What he's simply saying is that a woman should give her husband peace in a home. She should do everything to make her home comfortable so that her husband will enjoy being the lord of that estate. The lord of that house. You know, if the citizens of a country decides to go on strike, the president will not be happy. So if a wife is making the home unbearable, the husband will not find it comfortable to stay in that house. So women must not nag. But you see, what I taught today, if a woman follows the things I taught today, she will not nag. She can't be nagging 
and the reverencing, respecting, honoring, feeling for her husband, and she's snagging. It doesn't work. Once she's doing those things, the other negative ones will disappear. I didn't want to talk about the negatives because if you do the positives, there will be no negatives. The negatives are there because there are no positives. I don't know if you understand. So instead of wasting time on the negatives, we already know them. Let's talk about the positives, which is the cure for the negatives. Okay, next question. You talk about a, a man. A man must have to move. And a lady also has to move yes. before the noun grief. So my question is, Papa, if a man, because of me one thing or the other, he, he, he's eating from his own, he's living in the, the family house, house. sponsor his parents, now he decided to marry. And he really, sponsors his parents? Yes, feeding okay. his parents, doing everything for his okay, parents. so he has money. Yeah, he has he's money on to, his own. Okay, and yes. so he built a compound yes. where his parents are living, he too is living. Yes. And now he wants to marry. To marry. Because he has money, he should build another house. Okay. Where him and his wife will live together peacefully and he can be visiting his parents. Okay, sir. Since he has money. Okay, sir. My question is, there's a part of the scripture that says that um, men submit to one another. That as women submit to the husband, then they should also submit to the men, should submit to one another, both the wife and the man. Submitting to one another in the fear of the Lord. That's what he says, submitting to one another in the fear of the Lord. That is a context. And I will get there when I finish talking about husbands. And I will show where that kind of submission happens. But it is certainly not in the marriage. But there's a place where we all submit to one another in the fear of the Lord. But not in a home where the husband is the head. Christ does not submit to us. We submit to him. He loves us. Do you understand? So in a home, husband loves wife. Wife submits to husband. Case closed. That's the way it works. But we will get to where we will look at that scripture that talks about submitting to one another in the fear of the Lord. We will get there. Bless you. Papa, the, your teaching today is very timely. And, um, but um, many years ago, you taught us that there are three functions of dressing. Number one is for covering. Yes. For beauty. Yep. And for glory. Yep. How be it, in the circumference of this teaching, yep. you make mention of a dressing of a wife yes. to appease the husband. Yes. Okay. How about um, a woman that is married to an unbelieving husband, mm -hmm. as the case may be? Mm -hmm. Well, she's, she's, remember, she's... we talked about believers in Christ. The wife submits to her husband in all things. But when we come to the unbelieving husband, Brother Peter now began to talk about how the wife should conduct herself so she can win her husband by her behavior. There are two different scenarios. They are not the same. Husband and wife in Christ. The, husband will, the wife will submit to the husband in everything. Because your husband is a type of Jesus. And he can never ask the wife to do what does not glorify Jesus. But if the husband is an unbeliever. Then the wife's behavior. Respect. Esteem. Reverence. Fear. Loyalty. That her behavior is what will win her husband, not her dress, her behavior. So that's why when I was teaching, I said, remember, this is for those in the Lord. Then I said, now we're dealing with a husband who is not in the Lord. Is it clear? So there are two different scenarios. Yes. Uh, yes, Papa. Um, if a young man that is um, decided to get married and walk into a lady who is a believer in the church. Yes. And ask her out for marriage. Yes. And the lady will be asking, giving conditions. Yes. Where are you working? How much you have? Yes. Are your parents alive or dead? Yes. All those conditions. What yes. should a man do? That answer, will answer, well. answer them. And prove them. <laughs> because okay. she doesn't know you. And if she's going to leave her parents to come to you, you have to answer her questions. Show her everything she's asking. So that you give her confidence that you are the kind of person she can put her life to. So answer them. If those questions are important. In fact, if a lady doesn't ask those questions, she's very stupid. If it's not satisfactory, Papa, 
it is not satisfactory. Yes. It will be satisfactory when you answer her questions. You to ask her your own questions. Ask her, have you married before? Do you have children before? Uh, where do you live? Are you working? Are you a student? What of your parents? Are they alive? Is your father and mother together? In your family, is there any divorce? Ask her all those questions. Are your parents Christians or they worship native doctor? What, what do they do in your house? Is your, fat, is your mother and father in peace? Does your mother beat your father? Ask all those questions. See, yes. those are the questions a guy and a girl should be asking when they are planning for marriage. Not to say, I love you, I die for you. When I see your leg, I forget my house address. When I see your fingers, I forget to eat my food. That is not important. Those questions, those are the questions. Because why you are asking if her mother is beating her father? Is you want to know what is her background? Because there is tendency she too may beat her husband. Those are important questions. So answer her, you two ask her. Each of you keep asking questions until you are satisfied. Mm -hmm. So, okay, so. You know, today I didn't deal with singles because it's still in front. Because okay. we're going to deal with all of that. Yes. But just to answer in the immediate, those questions are important. Okay, sir. Papa, question two. Um, in the family, Papa, why did God, out of the billions of humans on earth, decided to choose Israelites as his own family? Question one. Two, why did he make them slaves in Egypt? Okay. Um, First of all, you must understand that God operates by patterns. Patterns. Adam, Eve. Through Adam, Eve explains his plan of salvation. Then, he comes to Israel as a tribe that came out of Jacob. Jacob produces Israel. Twelve tribes. And through Israel, models out how he wants to function through his family. Jesus comes, Israel becomes nothing. Because now the real has come from the shadow of communication. So now today, no Jew, no Gentile. Because the plan was not Israel. The plan was no Jew, no Gentile. But Israel was used as a prototype to exemplify, to demonstrate what God wants to do eventually. It's a mode of communication. It's just like Jacob I love, Esau I hate. But the two of them are not born. But that the purpose of election may stand is a mode of communication so that through those stories, you can see the mind of God for the church. Is it clear? That's what God was doing. Are you okay? Have I finished your questions? The next question was, how, why did he make them slaves in Egypt? Okay, God didn't make them slaves in Egypt. God only saw ahead of time that they were going to do what will enslave them. And he spoke of it. Because he is God, he can see the end from the beginning. And from the beginning, he can, he can talk about the end. And he can talk about what, how he plans to save. The only part God played was the salvation. He foresaw that they would be slaves by their misbehavior. And then he announced ahead of time what he will do to help them. He will deliver them from the hand of oppression. So in that communication, you see the foreknowledge of God. You see the predestination of God. You see the election of God. Which is what now happened in Christ. Which is what has brought all of us to the kingdom. So it was still a mode of communication. Is it clear? If you listen to Soterius is in fall. I dealt with that in Soteria Season 4. Soteria Season 4. It deals with the doctrine of election. It will help you a lot. It's about, you know, 30 hours or so. Bless you. Well, Daddy, I call you my teacher. Okay. Because you teach me a lot. I was a pastor in one church. But the day I met you preaching in radio, since that day, I began to follow you. Even to the, the point that the people love to come around to listen to you. By the grace of God, I open a house center. People have been coming there every day, every day to watch you live. And I thank God so much.
God has been so much faithful with me to support me for and everything so that people will come in there every day. Even when you say that uh, you give number that people should call, I said, no, I don't want to call you until I met you one and and one because uh, at times I think, uh, is it Jesus that appears life or what? Because you teach a lot. Daddy, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. And Daddy, I need your support to support us. And from Una, I quite went here. He caught a bit in one area. But uh, I believe it threw you people in my community. area. Yes. We will receive salvation. Amen. So well, Daddy, my question is Okay. This. Okay. If uh, maybe I am in the church. I met a lady, she's, she's okay, she's faithful, she's doing things in church, uh, and uh, I love her. Then I, I married her. By the time we are living together, now a little thing just hard, you know, in life. Not every time we eat sugar on honey, there's a time that a little challenge will come. Yes. When a little challenge just come, she decided to go. Ah. And you try to keep her. You try your best to keep her. Yes. And she threatened to kill you. That is it a sin to let her go. Wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I will answer you. Is that all the question? Yes. Just okay. that. Thank you for coming. For honor, what you will do is I think we have missionaries that are assigned to honor local government. So after the service, if you meet with uh, Ted, is there any Ted person in the service? Okay, Dr. Godwin, look at him. Dr. Godwin, stand up, let me see. If you meet with Dr. Godwin, he will walk with you and see how we can reach your people in honor. Because we already have a mission working on now. Okay, you, daddy. all right, God bless you. Then the, come your, alone, my sister, she's there, and her husband, and they want to, to speak to you one on one. A sister and a husband you came with yes, want daddy. to speak with me. Yes, so after the service, three of you meet Dr. Godwin. Dr. Godwin will make me speak to them. Thank you, daddy. God bless you. Thank now let me answer your question quickly. You're married to a woman and you met her in church. Two of you got married. Now first of all, don't be carried away by the fact that the lady is in your church and just marry like that. Always do your homework. Look at her very well. Talk to her friends. Talk to her. Talk to her immediate pastor, the pastor over her department. Make your inquiry. Make your observation. Watch her for some time before you, are, you know whether she's the kind of person that you can live with. And even then, you go through premarital counseling. All those are areas and moments of you checking and praying and praying and checking and asking and asking. Okay? If you do your work well, you will notice that behavior before marriage. You will have seen that this girl, anytime I give her money, she call me names. Anytime I say I don't have money, she will frown and keep malice. Mm -mm. This is not the kind of person I can live with. Just that alone, that's small behavior. When you are relating and you give her money, she's all over you. Then when, you, when she asks you money, I say I don't have. She frown and she's acting up. That is a sign that this one, she's coming for the money, not for me. So already that should make you know that we can't marry. Don't be, that's why in, in planning to get married, don't get emotional. Don't be doing, I love you, I die for you. You know, when you just do your eye like this, even my body cannot stand again. And then she'll be doing her eye like that and your body cannot stand. It's not the thing to do. That's when to ask questions. That's when to interrogate when you marry, there will be enough time to do, I love you, I see you, I cannot balance. When you sit down, I balance. All that will happen. But for the first time, it's questions, observation, checking, interrogation. Because you are about to make a lifelong decision. Now, you are married. And when there is no money, she wants to go. You beg her the first time. Money came, she stayed back. Money left, she wants to go. Escort her. <laughs> Carry her bag. Escort her. Tell her, I don't want you to suffer. 
But the way it is now, for the next three months, you will suffer. Let's go. Mommy, I have brought back your daughter. She says she cannot suffer. And my house now, suffering day. Let her stay because now her says she no one suffer. Escort her. Let her mother tell her that they don't behave like that. And if her mother cannot tell her, let her be there for some time. You too be there for some time. You understand? And of course, when doing that, you ask for pastoral counsel. Pastor will advise you. Pastor will talk to you. Pastor will talk to her. Pastor will look at all of that. All that is part of it. If you are already married, pastor will counsel, pastor will speak, we will pray. But if she cannot endure, she wants to go. Nobody can make her stay. Nobody can. Is that okay? Nobody can. But even with that, pastoral counsel will play a lot in it. Is that okay? Bless you. Are we blessed? Everybody blessed?